Welcome to another Executive Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I'm your host, Anthony Nyberg. Today we are speaking with this year's winner of the Leadership Legacy Award, presented by the Center for Executive Succession. The award, which was based on an international search and decided by a committee of board members from some of the world's largest companies, recognizes the CEO who is deemed to have provided exceptional leadership over a sustained period in creating a corporate culture and establishing processes that develop extraordinary leaders. This year's award winner is Elizabeth Liz Smith, Chairman and CEO of Bloomin' Brands, Inc. Bloomin' Brands owns and operates over 1,500 restaurants with over 100,000 employees, including restaurants such as Fleming's Prime Steakhouse and Wine Bar, Outback Steakhouse, Carabas Italian Grill, among others. Prior to joining Bloomin' Brands in 2009, Liz was the president of Avon Products. She also serves on the board of directors for Hilton Worldwide Holdings, U.S. Fund for UNICEF, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, and H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute. She is also the past national chair for Big Brother, Big Sisters of America. Liz, thank you very much for joining us. It is a tremendous honor and a treat to have you here on campus. Well, I'm honored to be here. I really am. I was very excited when I found out uh, that you guys have been so gracious to honor me with this uh, incredibly important award. And coming down here and already meeting some of the faculty and meeting some of the students, it's really a very energetic environment. I'm looking forward to meeting more of them. So you are getting the Leadership Legacy yeah. Award tonight, and we're, we're really grateful that you're coming to accept it here. Can you say a little bit about what this award means and more importantly what it means and why it's important to you to develop leadership in a way that you've done so successfully? Yeah, this is particularly meaningful to me because I view my most important job as a leader um, to make myself replaceable, right? And to train and develop and nurture the next talent in the organization, much in the same way I was trained and developed by some incredible leaders. Um, I always say, you know, I'm always very suspicious of, of folks that are, um, ir who make themselves irreplaceable because I think your number one job as a leader is to train and, and nurture and mentor the folks below you, right? And so an organization is only as sustainable and only as vital as the talent that it has in it. And so, Financial performance is important, but I will tell you it only comes when you have an active, engaged, passionate uh, team environment. So you can't really talk about leadership without, I think, starting with people development and talent development and your responsibility to nurture that. So this idea of helping make yourself replaceable, yeah. that's really a hard one for many of us to think about. How do you do that? for yourself, but also how do you convey that and, and get others in your organization to start working that way also? Well, it's interesting because I had um, a very uh, valuable lesson in making myself replaceable that I'll tell you about quickly. Um, and it, it really taught me to keep myself in perspective as well as the role that I had in getting out of the way and letting others shine. When I was at Kraft Foods, I happened to be a division president um, and they'd never had a division president that was going to go on maternity leave. Um, so it was a couple billion dollar division and I was going on maternity leave and I was taking the full leave and of course I thought, oh, what are they going to do and this, you know, this whole place is going to come apart without me and they need me and but I was, you know, taking my four months and I said, you can't call me and this and that and I had a, a great team and so I went on leave and the first week I was home, I didn't hear anything. I was like, wow, they're really being great. They're really respecting my time off. The second week, nothing. The third week, nothing. So I finally picked up the phone and I called the office. I was like, how's everything going? And they were like, it's great. Best month ever. We're like selling it. We've never had so much success. And I was somewhat taken aback. And then I realized, you know, instead of being a little bit like, really, you don't miss me? Um, I learned that I could take pride in that because I did have an incredible team. I had poured my heart and soul into developing them and they were awesome and they were talented and they didn't need me they were flying and so i think the most important thing you can do in making yourself replaceable if you're the leader is get out of the way get out of the way and let your people shine because my experience is if you give them what they need to be successful you give them the confidence you give them the opportunity um, they will deliver and then some 
oftentimes in an organization, I find if somebody's not performing or a team's not performing, I have to step back and ask myself, am I fully empowering them or am I in some way getting too involved, which also kind of hinders their ability to feel the ownership. And so I think we all have to recognize that uh, it's a sign of strength um, to have a strong succession and to have a strong bench. And the, the greatest thing you can do for an organization is to step out of the way and nurture in the next generation. Every successful company I've seen has had that philosophy or a leader at the top that's, that's had that philosophy. Well, it's on the great lessons. If we could all convey those to people around us, it would probably be many more successful organizations. I'm I sure. think so. I mean, I, cer I will tell you, I certainly benefited from having some incredible leaders and mentors that took the time to nurture and develop me, save me from myself, allow me to make mistakes, um, but also to launch me and, and put me in situations that I thought, well, I'm not ready for this. And they said, yes, you are. Um, that's our job. So this Leadership Legacy Award, is uh, nominated by employees of the company, and then we interview board members. And your board, of course, was glowing about you. <laughs> and talking about a number of- Must have been a good quarter. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Um, and talking about the really remarkable strategic changes that you engaged in and the performance that you've had over time. Can you say a little bit about what your leadership style and, and how you've made all this happen? It really is true. It's not one person that makes it happen. And so I would say um, number one thing is that um, I do believe um, in the importance in building um, an incredibly strong team, and that's number one. They make it easy. Um, the first thing I did when I got there uh, was where we did have skill gaps that we needed, we hired some amazing folks to join us to complement the strengths that we had. And so you start with a very high performing team. The second thing you have to do as a leader though then is empower them and delegate them and give them the opportunity and the responsibility to have their voices heard, to push back. I think people in the organization would say that I'm an informal leader and that I am a transparent leader and that I have passionate opinions and strong opinions but I absolutely can be have my mind changed and persuaded I think that they know that I want and accept their point of view and pushback I might not always like it in the moment but um, I'm always a better person for it the best decisions really get made when you create an environment where everybody feels like they can be honest and open in a respectful way where conflict is not a bad thing, it's simply discussing ideas, finding out where the pinch points are that you perhaps hadn't thought of. And so I think having this culture that I inherited, which was a wonderful culture, honestly, of teamwork, but also respecting the individual, I've just done my best to make sure that I kept that alive empowered people to feel like they could make a difference, like they could call an audible, they could speak the truth no matter what the consequences. In fact, it was encouraged. Um, and I think that makes for best decision making and a great organization. It also means that you're hearing everything that's going on and you need to hear everything that's going on in an organization. Sometimes if you close yourself off, you only hear the good things and what you really need to be hearing um, are the challenging things. So from a decision-making perspective, that's a, those are for sure best practices. But we often hear for leaders, particularly powerful leaders and CEOs, that they run into trouble because people s stop being honest with them and they stop hearing yeah. those extra perspectives. What yeah. do you do to try to ensure that you keep getting that honest? I spend so much time in that. The first thing I've done in the past is bring in, an, in a coach where I leave the room right? And I've done this every year with my team. I leave the room and they get a list of what is Liz doing well? What is Liz not doing well? What do we wish you would stop? And it's incredibly rich dialogue. And I think you have to have that. You have to absent yourself and allow the team to have that control and that dynamic and play it back for you. Um, but the other thing is that we, we spend a lot of time um, going around the table and everybody has to have an opinion and everybody has to state it. And it's most important that nobody get punished for having a different opinion, right? I always tell my team, it's fine to fail, but let's just fail faster, you know? 
the, the biggest challenges are when you don't create a safe environment where people are willing to take risk and willing to take challenges. And what happens is that even if they know that something's not going well, they're afraid to tell you and they just keep putting resources trying to resurrect something that probably should be taken offline. So we spend a lot of time collaborating. We spend a lot of time with leadership development. We spend a lot of time in informal dialogue. We also have this um, pet squirrel in our executive leadership team meeting that someone bought in um, and everybody's um, deputized to throw the squirrel at whoever they want if they're um, shutting down a conversation or shutting down an idea. So the worst thing you want to do is have the squirrel thrown at you because it means you're not listening and you're not hearing. So I think that keeps a lot of us in line as well. You also have to, as a leader, you have to talk about your own personal failures. What drives me crazy is that as people go up um, the ladder and achieve success, all they ever talk about is their successes. And that's not really helpful or instructive or build confidence. So I spend a lot of time with my group talking about my failures. And I've had some doozies. Um, all growing up in an organization at Kraft, I had this thing I called my wall of shame where every stupid idea or unsuccessful product that I ever launched, I had on a wall. And I would, I would parade people through that. And they were just shocked that I was like where I was in a position of authority having made these mistakes. And you, they would find themselves catching, the, you know, catching themselves. But I think you have to be open about your own failures, encourage people that it's a safe environment, but also help them to understand our real job is to fail faster, right? To have the courage to call the audible and then we move on. I think that's brilliant on so many lays. I, I personally would have to have a bigger office with more wall space. Yes, I, I, it got to be a problem. We had storage. And I like the squirrel <laughs> idea a lot. Here we'd have to have a, a rooster. You have a game right? cock. Yeah, that's what we'd yeah. have to You have. toss it around. Yeah. yeah, I like that. I think we may go with that. So one of the things that Bloom & Brands is known for is an incredible culture inside the organization. And you talked about that you inherited a culture that was great. But yeah. Can you say a little bit about what's really unique about that culture and what you've done to develop it even further? So the first thing I would say about the culture is that culture is what got me down there. I was living in New York City. I was president of a $12 billion cosmetics company. I had no intention of moving down to Tampa, Florida and going into the restaurant industry, an industry I had never worked in, particularly one that was challenged. We'd been taken private, and it was the height of recession, and trends were not good. And so I went down there with the intention of politely saying, thank you, but no thank you, um, and I met with the founders. And I was blown away by their vision and mission. And culture is what keeps people and culture is what brings people. So what was so special about the culture? Um, the first one was this absolute belief in their principles and beliefs, which everyone in the organization, all 90,000 employees could recite to you. Okay, it wasn't just one of those plaques that you put on the wall and no one listened to. This was the manual for how you should act and treat people. And there were a couple things that struck me. The first one was, is that the number one thing was we design, we will achieve success in our business by the success of our people. So it was always people first. And our people was defined as this very big tent that included team members, our strategic partners, our community, our stakeholders. It was everybody. So you had this sense that people are gonna be first, the other principle that they had, and it was literally in there, is that people do their best work when they feel like they're valued and that they want to be part of something that has a higher mission. These guys were so far ahead of their time, the four founders. Um, so Bloomin' Brands has always had this strong principles and beliefs of putting people first. And so the other thing that the founders did was they created this really unique model in the restaurant industry. And they had the insight is that everyone wants to own their own restaurant who works in the restaurant industry. We don't all have the capital to be able to do it. So they created this program where every single managing partner in our restaurants has a piece of that restaurant ownership has skin in the game. And across all of the doors, you will see their name and the word proprietor. So they're not managers, they're owner partners, proprietors of their store. And so that sense of authorship, that sense of ownership, it's a key part of Bloomin' Brands and everyone feels accountable and everyone feels audible. And when you have that kind of situation, it really breeds collaboration because nobody's feeling like, well, that's not my job, that's your job, it is our job. So when I went down there, um, I really 
had this wonderful culture to work with, but the challenge with a culture like that, and this is where we had to pivot, was we were so proud of our culture and so proud of our success that we misdorted it a little bit and thought that we had to hold on to every single thing that we did. So we hadn't changed the menu in 20 years. We hadn't changed the ambiance. We hadn't changed anything. We had misunderstood honoring our heritage with living in the past. And we had to evolve to understand we're going to honor the past, keep the things that are unique to our DNA, but master the present and build for the future. So we really had to introduce, and I worked really hard to introduce that change muscle because I got folks to understand and our mantra became, if we don't like change, we're gonna like irrelevance a lot less. And so we joke about that a lot now, but we had to keep the pride, but also have enough self-awareness to say, okay, we must change. This isn't, this isn't gonna work in the next generation and the next iteration. So I think we kept the principles and beliefs, but we added a certain agility and a certain nimbleness and a certain respect for the fact that we have to change to keep up with the customer. They're not going to stay put because we want them to. So you have talked about a few things, some great culture and your openness and your honesty with, it, with employees and, and getting them to really give you meaningful feedback. Are there other things that you'd point to in terms of what helps you develop great and sustainable leadership? Well, we spent a lot of times at, at uh, Bloom and Brands. Um, it was a very autonomous culture. Um, so for the first 20 years, there was no human resource department. When I got there, it was a $4 billion company without a human resource department. Kind of hard to imagine. Because the belief was that as a manager, you were responsible for developing your people and for nurturing and developing them. And so a very noble reason. The problem was, as you grow to $4 billion, you've got to have a core group whose job it is to tune everything else out and say, how are we doing as a company? How are you doing as an organization? How are we doing developing our leaders and developing our talents? So we had to build an HR organization almost from scratch. I hired the first HR person at Blooming Brands at corporate in 2010 when I got there. And we were already $4 billion. So from there, we listened, we kept what people loved about, you know, the autonomy, but we added a very strong leadership development department. We added really strong and trained in how do you do performance management? How do you do development plans? What's succession planning? What's career pathing? They'd never seen a development plan. They'd never gotten an, a review, a formal sit down review, and they never had a development plan. So we've embedded those processes where you have a voice, where you know how you're doing. And it's not this semi-annual check-in. You know how you're doing. You can talk about what you need. You also have a development plan where people are thinking two and three steps ahead of you to make sure you get what you need. Because what can happen in an organization is you can tend to freeze people in positions because they're so good and so efficient. That's not fair to them, right? You have to show them what's next. You have to show them what they're capable of and that you're thinking two and three steps ahead for them. So we spend a lot of time thinking two and three steps ahead for each one of our people and making sure we're giving them the experience they need now to be able to take the next step that they want to be doing. The other thing is we have a very informal culture that has constant feedbacks. Um, I have quarterly town halls, but I have monthly stand-ups where we serve um, drinks and food. We are, after all, a restaurant company. Um, every month for two hours, and anyone's free to come, and we mingle, and we talk, and I do answer questions in my leadership team when we're just up, in the, up there answering questions. The other thing I do, because I just think the key, and you're seeing a theme, is just constant communication, constant transparency. I have what's called office hours, and every employee, all 94,000, are allowed to come by every other Tuesday from 4 to 5 and tell me what's on their mind, what they're, whether they think they have a good idea, whether they, th they think I have a bad idea. Because you can have the leadership programs, and you can have the formal tools, and those are important. But if you're not in there listening and responding and reacting in the moment to them, they're not growing as much as well. The other benefit is you have no idea how much I have learned about what's going on in the organization 
uh, how something that we decided up here is really playing out further down in the organization. And so I call these guys the truth tellers and they love it because they're empowered to come, you know, right in and talk. So um, I spend a lot of time listening and a lot of time talking. So changing gears a little bit, you've been on a number of publicly traded boards and of course your own board. And you mentioned a little earlier that 50% of your board is, is women yes. holding these positions. Can you say a little bit about, in part, why are there not, why do we still yeah. have this discrepancy mm -hmm. and what we can be doing to have more boards that look like yours? Yeah. So, um, first of all, 50% uh, of our board is female um, and I have an incredible board. I have what's recognized as an incredible board, high powered. Everybody has a opinion, they share it, very much the right dynamic. Um, I don't think of it as I have 50% women on my board. I think of it as I have the best nine people I can around the table. Um, I also think that we live in a multicultural world and so it's kind of crazy not to have a multicultural board because how else will you understand how the world works? You know, if you, everyone looks like you around a table, you're not getting a representation of how things are in the world. So it's not just the right thing to do to have um, a diverse board, both in terms of gender, but also ethnicity. It's not just the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. It's the good business decision. It has been proven that more diverse boards and boards with more women and diversity have higher success rates in governance, etc. So it's a little puzzling to me when both the sheer performance metrics are there, right? And the pool of talent is there, why we haven't made more progress. I spend a lot of my time, because it's really important to me, because I've been, you know, mentored and by both male and female bosses. Uh, I put a lot of time and energy into trying to um, uh, change that situation at the board level. Um, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I have um, been uh, key in getting a number of women on um, public company boards. It's something that is a passion of mine um, because I believe in it so strongly. Uh, I think what we can do is continue to point out the benefits. We can, as um, you know, uh, I think it was uh, Madeleine Albright said that there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women. And I really believe that. Um, so I think it's um, my responsibility, if I have some type of seat at the table, to make sure that I'm looking out for others and recommending and setting up networks and introducing people. And that's how change happens. Change happens one step at a time. Uh, so I'm very optimistic because I think that the group of leaders coming up, both male and female, um, are, are very nimble and agile and they're going to be bringing some different thinking to the table regardless of their gender of their diversity but a huge mistake from a business standpoint and just from a you know obviously what's a humanity standpoint not to have that type of representation around the table does it seem like it's actually getting better is it, it it's hard to it's know it's hard from the to numbers, tell from right? the numbers um so I think it's getting better, but far, far, far too slowly. It's, if you had told me when I graduated from business school in 1990 that of Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 CEOs that only 5% would be women, I would have said no way. Okay, so I graduated 28 years ago. And I think maybe there were two, Catherine Graham and somebody else, so maybe there were 2%. If you had told me that 28 years later that it would only be 5%, I would have said, no way. So it's very, um, it's very concerning and it, it, it needs to change. So one of the challenges, of course, is that many boards like to have CEOs or at least former CEOs yeah. on their board. Yeah. And there's still the pipeline for women to yeah. become CEOs is still yeah. pathetic, yeah. really. So that's fair. That's can exactly it go right. the other way? I mean, can you get more? Can we get more women on boards, and will that help get more women to become CEOs? Oh, or absolutely. Are we stuck. Absolutely. No. First of all, the notion. I know everybody wants a sitting CEO on their board and all of that. You know that credential, but the reality is, is that some of the best board members are the level below the C-suite, where you do have a very strong and vital pipeline that is much more representative. Below the C-suite. So. Absolutely. Okay. So I have Tara Walpart Levy who joined my board at Google 
uh, when she was a senior director. I put her on the Bloomin' Brands board, and she sat next to Jim Craigie, who was chairman and CEO of Church and & Dwight, and she sat next to Mindy Grossman, who was chairman and CEO of Home Shopping Network, then Weight Watchers Now, and she was a senior director promoted to a VP. I wanted her around that table because of her experience and her expertise. She didn't have the same level of working experience or business card as some of the other folks around the table, but she brought an incredible perspective. So I think it's fairly myopic of some boards to think that they have to get these C-suite executives only to make a powerful and impactful board. I think if we open our eyes and open the lens up to understanding that we're C-suite experience, whether it's uh, you know in human resources, supply chain, CEO, whatever, is helpful, that there's so much rich um, interaction and input that you can get by going to that next level in the organization. I've had a lot of success with that. And so do you think that other organizations are going to follow your example and reach down oh, a little I think bit? they have. Okay. I think um, if you look at some of, uh, some of the folks in, in, in technology, I think they've done a better job at reaching further down in the organization. Now, they don't have a good job on <laughs> women in management, women in senior positions. Um, so far, I know that there's a lot of awfully um, committed folks uh, you know, trying to change all that. But I think a lot of organizations have started to figure that out, and you do see more of that. Um, I, I was telling you a passion of mine is, is to help women get on boards, and so I have placed, uh, or introduced, I certainly didn't place, introduced a number of uh, friends of mine who are CEOs of public companies where we're looking for board members um, to uh, folks in the, uh, that I knew that were not, um, you know, C-level that I thought would be great fit for, for their board, and they've joined, and, and I always get a, a, a huge thank you. Are there specific things that, that women should be doing to try to make themselves more, uh, more acceptable or open to boards, or is there anything, can people be doing anything proactively, or like what are you doing to help in addition to making these introductions? It's a great point. It's not a woman's problem. No. It's, it's a human problem. A lack of a diverse representation, whether it's any measure of diversity that you want to come up with, at the table is just a problem on many levels. The first one is it doesn't lead to the best decision making, it doesn't lead to the best culture, and it doesn't support the best outcomes and growth. So it's really all of our responsibility to, and that's why I believe so strongly in the responsibility of leaders to mentor and teach and get involved. I really believe that we have a responsibility to pay it forward. It bothers me when I see uh, folks that have achieved a level of success that don't spend a decent amount of their time or a significant amount of their time bringing others along and paying it forward. Because that's our job. Because someone did it for us. Someone did it for us. There's no way I would be a, a, a public company CEO. I don't think it's a coincidence that as my direct boss over the years, I've had four bosses that ended up being Fortune 500 CEOs. Two male, two female. Irene Rosenfeld, Andrea Jung, Jim Craigie. I mean, you can name them. And they all took the time to mentor and coach and nurture. And that's our responsibility. So I think we need to challenge leaders in positions and, 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 and bring them into the spotlight and say, why, why aren't you making progress? Liz, thank you so much for joining me. I would love to sit here and talk to you for much longer. Um, I we would really too. appreciate having you here. Thank, I, I, you. thank you, and I'm really looking forward to um, meeting more of your students. I love the passion and energy, so thank you for having me. You just listened to another Executive Conversation. Today we were honored to learn from Liz Smith this year's winner of the Leadership Legacy Award. Liz reminded us that sustaining leadership is paramount to business excellence, and this requires attention, resources, and commitment. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program and the Center for Executive Succession here at the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina, thank you for joining us.